Hello, Light of the World. I'm Jarrett Martin. Uh, for those who you who don't know me, I am Pastor Jerry's and Pastor Jackie's uh, son. And I am so happy to be sharing the word with you guys this Sunday morning. Uh, I hope that quarantine isn't, uh, isn't too bad at all. You see that I have a hat on today um, because if I'm honest with you, my hair is very nappy and I need to see uh, a barber immediately. Uh, but I'm excited to share today specifically about the story of David. Uh, a lot of what I'm going to be sharing is story that you've already heard that you know really well. Uh, but I hope to share it from just a little bit of a different perspective. So uh, if you could just go ahead and turn in your Bible, uh, we're going to be reading a lot of scripture today. But First Samuel uh, 16, verse 4 through 12. 1 Samuel, verse 16, verse 4 through 12. And it says, So Samuel did as the Lord instructed. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town were trembling to meet him. What's wrong, they asked, and have you come in peace? Yes, Samuel replied, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Purify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. Then Samuel performed the purification rite for Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice too. When they arrived, Samuel took one look at Eliab and thought, surely this is the Lord's anointed. But the Lord said to Samuel, don't judge by his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord doesn't see things the way that you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse told his son, Abinabad, to step forward and walk in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, This is not the one the Lord has chosen. Next, Jesse summoned Shema. Uh, but Samuel said, Neither is this the one that the Lord has chosen. In the same way, all seven of Jesse's sons were presented to Samuel. But Samuel said to, G to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen any of these. And Samuel asked, are these all the sons you have? They're still the youngest, Jesse replied, but he's out in the field watching the sheep and the goats. Send for him at once, Samuel said. We will not sit down until he arrives. So Jesse sent for him. He was dark, handsome, with beautiful eyes. And the Lord says, this is the, is the one. Anoint him. Let's pray for him for a moment. Uh, Lord God, uh, we believe that you heal every single hurt. Just show us how to walk in your healing this morning. Uh, I love this passage uh, because what we're going to unfold as our very first point here is going to be a sobering truth. It is the truth that life hurts. Number one, life hurts hurts. And you see this unfold so much in the story of David, that he uh, is the one that, that is often at the end of a lot of life's hurts and pains. And just to start off his story, when he very first shows up on the scene, it starts with a prophet who is looking for the next king, and he invites everyone to a feast and tries to select the next king out of the set of Jesse's sons. And he looks around, and Jesse has left one of his sons out in the field. He has neglected and forgotten about David. A lot of the uh, Hebrew scholars actually believe that David may have been the result of some sort of merit, of some sort of extramarital affair of Jesse, or, or someone that he, a relationship that he wasn't proud of. So he didn't think that his own son was worth being considered as the next king of Israel. And David set out there all alone as all of his brothers were brought up to be the next king, and he was forgotten and neglected. But the Lord sends a prophet that comes and finds him in the field and anoints him. It does not matter uh, if someone is trying to hold back your blessing, hold back your calling, hold back what God is doing in your life, that there is no way they can obscure you from the plan and the promise of what God is going to do, that he will send someone to anoint you and prepare you for everything that he's called. So David is, finds himself neglected 
uh, by his father, but anointed by God. And as the story goes on, we see uh, pretty quickly that the favor of God is on David's life. Soon, uh, Goliath shows up on the scene, and, and all of again, all of David's brothers go off to fight Goliath. And we see in a, in a couple of passages later that David shows up on the scene with his brothers in that fight. And in 1 Samuel 17, 26-29, uh, it starts and says, David asked his shoulder standing nearby, what will a man get for killing this Philistine and ending his defiance of Israel? Who is this pagan Philistine anyways that he's allowed to defy the armies of the living God? And these men gave David some reply. They said, yes, that is the reward for killing him. But when David's oldest brother, Eliab, heard David talking to the men, he he was angry. What are you doing around them? He demanded. What are those... What about those few sheep that you're supposed to be taking care of? I know about your pride and deceit, and you just want to see the battle. What have I done now? David replied. I was only asking a question. David goes just wide-eyed and innocent, uh, looking to, to participate in the fight, looking to defend Israel. And then his own brother, his own flesh and blood, uh, undercuts him and throws insults at him and, and tells him to get back with the sheep. And for the second time uh, in the story, and as many chapters, uh, we see David being rejected, David being wounded by his brothers. So you all know the end of the story that 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 David is victorious in that he in that he wins and defeats Goliath. But I can't help but imagine the sting of what his brother said stayed in his heart. So we see him uh, rejected by his father, but anointed. We see him wounded by his brothers, but victorious. David's uh, uh, life and influence continues to grow and go on. And many of us uh, know about the relationship that he had with Saul. I, I'm not going to uh, get into it, but again, on the in the next chapter in 1 Samuel 18, it's the story of, of David uh, being invited into the palace, that, that he goes to play music for, for, for Saul, uh, and, and that Saul actually throws spears at him. And if that weren't enough, Saul tries to use his own daughter as bait, uh, so that David will go and, and get killed uh, trying to do some crazy conquests to, to, to win Saul's uh, daughter in marriage. So Saul is this man that who is in power, who is doing everything to try to, to destroy David, to try to attack him, to try to end him, to try to kill David. There's only been three chapters And David's own dad, his brothers, and now the king himself are coming against David. He was mistreated by a king. Uh, That that chapter ends by saying no matter what he did, he was successful and that he continued to be victorious and his influence continued to grow. So rejected, but anointed, wounded, but successful, uh, mistreated but influential. Uh, That's the place that David finds himself in, in life. He finds himself in a place where, where, where there's a lot of good there, but there's also a lot of pain. There's also a lot of wounding. There's also a lot that has affected his heart, which kind of leads me to my next point. We hurt. Not only uh, does life hurt, but we hurt. Why, why is everything that happened to David important? And what does that say about our own hearts? Why should we pay attention to it? The answer to that is because we live out of our hearts. What a man is in his heart, what a man is in his heart and thoughts is, is ultimately who he is. If we are people that have been hurt, then most likely we are people who will hurt people. So we hurt that, that, that 
when we look at David's stories, I'm sure many of you all would find similarities that there's either been a, a father or a parental figure who has hurt you, that you may have experienced rejection from your peers, that, that there's been people in power, whether it's government, police officers, bosses who have mistreated you. I think oftentimes the, the, cumula- the accumulation of, of life's pain, probably 95% of the time is one of those three things. Parents, peers, and people in power who have hurt us. But that affects our life. That affects the way that we see the world. That affects the way that we love people. Our hurts and our pains actually uh, influence us. So we hurt. We hurt. We're going to see this uh, lived out in the life of David. I'm going to kind of paraphrase the story of Bathsheba, but we're going to see some of these exact same dynamics. So we all know that it was a time, the story starts off, it was a time when, when most leaders and most rulers go off to war and David stayed in the palace. He goes up to the ceiling, or so he goes up on top of the roof, and he sees Bathsheba bathing. He calls her over. They have an affair. Uh, and then soon she sends him a note that she has a child. Now, David, uh, the, the man who is after God, who, who's after God's own heart, has a bright idea. He says, I'm going to go. I'm going to get her husband, Uriah, who is one of my most loyal servants. I'm going to take him off of the front lines in battle. And I am actually uh, going to try to see if I can get him to go like sleep with his wife and just forget, it, forget all of this. Kind of, kind of muddy the waters here. And he does it. He tries to get Uriah drunk. He invites him home. He does everything that he can do. And Uriah is too good of a guy. He says, I can't go home. I can't be with my wife when all the other men are out there fighting. Uriah is a better man than David. And he goes back to battle carrying his his own death wish. And and David tells them, hey, when you put Uriah on the front line and then I want all of you guys to back up, leave him alone so he will die. That exact thing happens. Uriah dies uh, shortly after... uh, David invites Bathsheba and he marries her. And then at some point, uh, the baby is born and then the prophet Nathan comes. But before we get to that point, I want to I want to talk about David's heart and what he's done here. You see, just like uh, David's dad uh, neglected him as a son, David neglected all of the other warriors that he was supposed to be with in Israel. Just like the way that David's brothers wounded him, David goes goes ahead and he wounds Uriah. And then just like the way that the people in power had affected David before and how, and how they had, had, um, had mistreated David before, David mistreats Bathsheba and his family. So you see that the pain that David once had that was unhealed actually just gave birth again in his life. And he can see all of this. That, that, that the man who's supposed to be, be the father of, of, of Israel, the man that was supposed to be the brother of, of all of these warriors is now acting just like his own father in his own brother, in the own abusive people in power. You see, I sometimes wonder if as David was climbing the ladder, if he ever thought about these things, if these things were ever in his mind. And oftentimes we think, man, if I am successful and I am growing in influence and I am growing in power and I'm growing in all these things, then, then I'll just ride this momentum. No one will realize uh, the deep pains, the deep wounds that I have in my life. But the truth is, people might not, might not see it at first, but it always rises to the top. And instead of hiding it, what actually happens is that you rise in a platform so more people see it when it comes and manifests in your life as death and destruction and sin and shame. 
I believe that David had some things that he didn't deal with that resulted in him acting out when he got God's promise. That if we, if we don't tend to the wounds that we get while we're in the field, we will always, always be out of alignment with what God wants us to do when we get into the palace. So David, the great one, the one who would sing songs to God, now has, has this stain of sin all over his life. And God sends the prophet uh, Nathan to come speak with him. And I love it. He gives this whole story. Um, I, don't, I don't know if I'm going to read it all. I don't think I actually have it right here in front of me. But he reads this whole story. He reads this whole, um, this whole parable that he comes and says, Hey, there was this guy that had a lamb that he loved. And he would take care of it and he would coddle it at night and, and he would uh, nurture this lamb. And then there was a man that was just, that had as many lamb as he could ever want. And he comes and takes a lamb away from the other guy and kills it. And David's like, this is the worst thing that's ever happened in Israel. And Nathan responds, David, that's you. That's what you've done in this situation. And, and not only that, but the child that you have is going to die. And as you can understand, David has been found out for the very first time. He is, he, he's crying. He's, he's distraught. He's upset. He's weeping. But I, I want to bring something to your attention here. Is that what, what, what Nathan is doing as a prophet is the exact same thing that Jesse did or sorry, sorry, that uh, Samuel did as a prophet early on. That, that sometimes we think, man, this is a rebuke. This is, this is God's judgment on him. This is God shaming David. No, when, what God is doing is he is, is telling David what, who he actually is. Is that when Nathan comes and confronts him, that he is actually drawing out David's true identity. That David is a king, that he's a son of God, that he is not uh, someone who is going to be an adulterer. But he's saying, hey, come back into alignment with what I am doing and what, what I want to do in your life. It is no different from what Samuel was doing, that he that before he was setting him into his destiny, when he was anointed, he was set into his destiny. And a second time, God is sending a prophet to, to further set David into his destiny. That even uh, when we sin, that even uh, when we fail, that God's voice in our life is not one of condemnation, but it is affirming that we are his, that we are men and women of God, sons and daughters, that we are royalty. See, if God didn't care, he'd leave David on his own. But we serve a God who cares enough to pull David from where he is and send him on a different trajectory. No matter how much you have messed up, we serve a God who is big enough to pull you from where you are and loves you enough that he will send you a word, no matter how embarrassing it is, to pull you out of your situation. That's good. So David hears this word and, he cry, and he's crying and weeping. The hurt, the hurt man has hurt so many people, including the son that has yet to be born. And he writes something in the Psalms that's really powerful and leads me to my third point. Is that the world hurts that we hurt, but Jesus heals. So in the midst of all of this pain, in the midst of all of this suffering, David writes in Psalms 51, verse two through 10. You've heard it before. Wash me clean from my guilt. Purify me from my sin. For I recognize my rebellion. It haunts me day and night. Again, you, and you against you and you alone have I sinned. I have done what is evil in your sight. 
you, you will be proved right in what you say, and your judgment against me is just. For I am born a sinner, yes, from the moment my mother conceived me. But you desire honesty from the womb, teaching me wisdom even there. Purify me from all of my sins, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Oh, give me back my joy again. You have broken me. Now let me rejoice. Don't keep looking at my sins. Remove the stain of guilt. Create in me a clean heart. Renew a loyal spirit in me. In this verse, David is lamenting and he, uh, he is in such despair that he describes sin in so many different ways. Save me from my rebellion, my waywardness, my evil, my failure. And I want to hone in on what he says to end. Create in me a clean heart, O Lord. Renew a loyal spirit within me. Create in me a new heart. He knew, David knew, that what I need is I don't need a fresh coat of paint. I don't need just to be clean, but I need a completely new and a completely restored heart. It's almost a picture of a house. He's like, look, I don't need you to just put new light fixtures up. I need you to pull, tear out some walls and put up some new ones. I need, I need you to rip up all the carpet. I need to do a all out renovation of my heart that, that I need something to change here and now. And he goes on and he says, create. That word create is the word bara. It is the same word that is used in Genesis 1 about creation. So, so he's saying, Lord, breathe something new in me. Make me a complete new creation. Do something to, that's so powerful in me. Use all of your creative work, all of your creative, creative force to put something brand new inside of me. That's what Jesus did on the cross, that he died so that we don't have to live with our old hearts. We don't have to live victims to our pain. We don't have to live with our old hurts and our hearts of stone. But Jesus said that he's actually come and that he will replace our hearts with hearts of flesh that are, that are soft and that are tender, that, are, that, that can live in love in the way that he wants to. You just heard a message about David. The Bible says he was a man after God's own heart. But David had things that he did in his life that was displeasing to God and disappointed God. He found himself in a place where he needed to come before God and ask for forgiveness and ask for mercy. He cried out and said, have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness. I want to tell you something. It doesn't matter. What doesn't matter? It doesn't matter what you've done. God will still have mercy upon you. It doesn't matter what you've accomplished, what you've done to hurt other people, or if other people have hurt you. God is merciful in his love, and he will accept your coming to him and asking him in your heart to forgive you and to receive him as Lord and Savior. That was the purpose that Jesus Christ came, so that we can all come to him when we mess up. If we confess up, he will clean us up and give us a brand new life. I don't know who you are, and I don't know where you are, but if you're there listening to me right now, you can come to Christ. It only takes a moment for you to make a decision in your mind and in your heart that you want Jesus Christ to be your Lord. You can do that right now. Just ask him, Father, come into my life. Come into my heart. Forgive me of my sin. Cleanse me, O oh God. Give me a new heart and a new mind. I want to live for you. He will accept you. The Bible says if you would confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead and that he is Lord, master now in your life, then you will be saved. If you prayed that prayer with sincerity, 
Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit will come to take up residence in your heart. If you made a decision for Jesus Christ today to invite him to be the Lord of your life, I'm inviting you to take the next step. You can raise your hand. You can see it on your screen. Let us know that you've made this decision and we'll reach out to you. And then there's a next step button on your screen as well. We will get some information from you and then we'll have someone to follow up with you. We're praying for you and we're expecting God to do great things in your life.